let me introduce our speaker, Martin Mikas, who is actually right now a board member of Nokia. Congratulations, Martin. And uh, he was uh, the uh, CEO of MySQL and took the company, uh, sold it to Sun Microsystems, and now he's the CEO of Eucalyptus and the leader of the open, uh, open flow movement. So um, now, Stan, take, take my place and keep on. Just want to provide a little more introduction on Martin. I was thinking how we can explain what Martin is doing. It's definitely not a social network. So it's uh, so I tried to find a simple explanation, and uh, everybody knows uh, Steve Jobs, right? And many people here respect <coughs> Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs used to say that a computer is a bicycle for for the mind, right? It helps your mind. So he had this phrase he was repeating all the time. And uh, so if you look at Apple, Apple produces these bicycles for the mind, but they were expensive bicycles, right? So you have to pay lots of money for those bicycles. And what Martin was working on, I think, and is working on now, are just kind of inexpensive free bicycles that everybody can share. You know, and... Uh, free Rolls Royce cars. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and actually... Uh, we are going to tell, uh, talk about this, but he said he once went to this festival called Burning Man. And it's interesting, they have free bicycles there. You can bring your own bicycle, but if you don't have a bicycle, you actually are going to, they're going to keep a bicycle for you. And that was a kind of a funny introduction, but also, if you think about what uh, open source is doing, in particular my, my SQL and now cloud computing, we are now, I think, at a point in history where it's very easy and very inexpensive for, for a person to impl implement an idea. It used to be that you, know, you had to have uh, lots of resources to have an idea, and now it's very simple. And I think open source and uh, cloud computing are helping this. So lots of people around the world now have a chance to do something in their life and uh, you know to work on their ideas and uh, I'm really happy to you know that we have a fire chat with uh, fire side chat with Martin today because he contributed a lot to this open source and cloud computing. Actually, I have lots of questions. Um, let's start with some funny questions. So Stan sent me probably 50 <laughs> questions ahead of time, <laughs> and I must say I've never seen so insightful questions before an interview, and I don't think there's any chance of us going through them tonight, <laughs> but, but I was very much impressed by, by the, the depth of, of the oh, questions you, you said. Let us put them on the uh, Yes, I hope so, unless I say something stupid, which <laughs> may happen. Okay, we'll, publish, we'll publish all the questions and answers on our website. Yeah. So, Martin, uh, the first question is about your experiences as a Boy Scout. And you said, uh, and you mentioned that uh, this childhood experiences of being a Boy Scout actually influenced you a lot. So maybe you can elaborate about this part of your life. So I didn't think about it back then, but I was maybe 12 or 13 when I became a Boy Scout. And I think my leadership ideas come from that time and those principles. And I had no idea back then that I would be an entrepreneur or an engineer or anything. But, but I, if I just look back, it was a very formative experience to be a young boy out there. And in Scandinavia with Boy Scouts, we don't have many grown-up leaders. You know, in some countries, you have lots of grown-ups who lead the Boy Scouts. But we were just the young kids, and we had to lead each other. And we were. it was like in high-tech. A lot of people who get together who think they can manage, but in reality they cannot. Meaning they overestimate their own resources and their own abilities. And then they go out into the forest, and on my first overnight trip, it was in the middle of the winter in Finland, we never got a fire to, to burn properly. So we froze that whole night in the snow. Well, we had a, an open tent, but we never got the fire. So, But at, at the same time, it taught me that you just have to keep going and you have to work together. There's no other way. You can't say, I won't help you, or I'm not cooking, or I'm not doing this, because 
when you're just six or seven teenagers out there, everybody must contribute for it to be a success. And I think it is the same in high-tech companies, that unless you get that sort of team spirit, you just go nowhere. That's, that's why I think it was very important. But back then, I didn't think about that. I just think, thought about having fun with my friends and, you know. And your parents, did they actually, uh, you know, influence you in going to Boy Scout? Did, did they want you to become a Boy Scout? I'm, I'm your... sure I resisted <laughs> because I, did, I wasn't very active back uh -huh. then. But luckily, my older brother, he brought me there. And I'm sure I, I didn't want to do it first. Not that I remember, but, but I, you know. When your big brother tells you, you do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and a, as a Boy Scout, so what do you do? Do you go to like for seven days and you sleep there? Or how is it actually, you know, what's the actual in Finland, you know? Yeah, what you are the do, typical well, things? You do that once a year, but you do those weekend trips. You have the weekly meeting. Uh, we had it every Tuesday evening. I had to take the bus into Helsinki and walk to the place and then get back. And And in the Boy Scouts... Nothing is ever ready. Whatever you do, it's sort of halfway. You know, you never get it perfect. So you must learn to live with uncertainty, exactly like in a startup. If you work for a company or a fine law firm, you can demand that everything is perfect because that company has had time to prepare it. But when you are young Boy Scouts and you go out there, somebody forgets to, to bring part of the food. And what can you do? You eat what you have. Or somebody forgets the axe or the saw, and suddenly you can't cut down any trees to, for the fire, and you just have to survive. So you learn this, learn to live with this constant feeling of not being sufficient and not being, not having everything in perfect shape. But still, you just must, you must keep going. <laughs> so you actually then graduated from the high school, and I think you went uh, to study physics, mm -hmm. technical physics. Mm -hmm. At the university in Finland, uh, Technical <coughs> University of Helsinki, right? Right. Why, why physics? Uh, I had this thinking that Helsinki University of Technology was the best school in Finland. And I can admit, my parents went there, all my siblings went there, all my friends. So I thought, I must go to that school because it's just known as the best school. But I wasn't inter interested in engineering. So mm -hmm. I thought, what is the least mechanical topic I can study? And then I also was ambitious. I thought, what's the most difficult to get into? And technical physics had the highest entrance mm -hmm. requirements, and I felt I could pass them. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try physics. That's actually very interesting because after, you know, if you graduate in physics, it's not so clear what are you going to do, right? If you're like a software engineer, you graduate, you become, you program, yeah. right? Uh, was were you scared that uh, you wouldn't find a job, or maybe you thought you would become a leader or manager? Or... I have never planned my career, That's and it. people have complained to me. Say, Martin, why don't you work on your career, and why do you? Why don't you? Why are you not more focused? But I never did that. But but they did tell us on this department of technical physics. We were you know seventy four new students that year, and they said. Half of you are physicists and will always be that, and half of you have no idea what you are and you will go anywhere. And it really is true that some of us are, some of my friends from that time are physicists today and the others are anything. Salespeople, leaders, you know, they started studying something else. So there was a widespread among those who didn't know. And I was one of them. I, you know, I didn't know... I just knew I wanted to study at that school, and I didn't care much what my career opportunities would be. So, Martin, so uh, for physics, for instance, right? You have a scientist, and you have somebody becomes a professor and does science, PhD, whatever, and then there is a businessman. So, you have people doing science and very successful in science, yeah. and you have people very successful in business. Yeah. Are there any common things uh, to become successful in business or, or in science? Or do you have to work hard? Or 
do you do you have any friends who are scientists or people I that do. you know? I have six technical co-founders right. at Eucalyptus who are all scientists. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, do you find anything funny about them or yes, something that surprises I you? I think, I think scientists are funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure scientists think that people like me are funny. I see. But, but when I went to visit the Eucalyptus team in 2010 mm-hmm. and we sat around the table and they interviewed me, I just, I was so blown away by their, uh, it, not intelligence, of course they are very intelligent, but their seriousness and devotion to it. And, and I realized that these guys are brilliant at what they do, but they need somebody like me. And I may be brilliant at what I do, but I need somebody like them. I could never create a database or a cloud platform or any product. I have no such abilities. Mm-hmm. So, so Martin, so I understand that after you sold uh, Mice SQL to Sun Microsystems, you became an entrepreneur in residence, and you were kind of thinking, what's the next, what's the next thing for you? You were evaluating different things, and probably it was very important because that was your life, right? Yeah. You had to make this huge choice. Uh, so there are two questions. My question, one question: Why did you choose Eucalyptus? And then another question is. Did you look at some other things? Were there some other interesting things? You said, maybe yeah. I do this, I do that. So you had like a list and then you did the eucalyptus. Yes, but, but let me first go back <laughs> to what you said first. So people always say, Martin, you sold my SQL to Sun. And every time I hear it, uh, I'm crying a little bit. <laughs> because we didn't build my SQL to sell it. And sure, it got sold and we accepted the offer from Sun. So... Of course, it's true that I, we sold it and I was the CEO, so you can say I sold, sold it. But, but I hope that people know that we were building something which we felt was amazing and we were ready to go public. But at that point, we got two offers from two different companies. And then I realized that we probably would never go public because the offers were going so high. They were so much higher than what we would have been worth as a public company initially. So I realized we, it was difficult to say no. So we sold. but And I'm proud of it. And of course, I sold the company. But we didn't build it to sell it. We so, built- Martin, so, so VCs and you, when the, yeah. you, you were selling the company, you yeah. had the same opinion or two different opinions? Was it like VCs would push you to sell, say that they, they need to get money? No, would- this was the, the, the frightening part that... Technically, I was the CEO, but I was not a shareholder. I had stock options, but I did not have shares. And I'm very strict on roles in a company. So I felt I reported to the board, and the board represented the shareholders. So I thought when, when we got an offer to, to sell my stock, I thought, okay, they will decide. They are the shareholders. I'm just the CEO. And they will, they will have their mind, and, and I, will be, I, would, I don't have to worry about it. They came to me and said, Martin, what do you want to do? And I said, me? I'm, I'm not the owner of this company. But they all said, Benchmark and Index and IVP. They said, we will do what you recommend. If you want to say no to these two offers, we will back you. And that made it hard. Because suddenly it was my decision I mean, formally it wasn't. It really wasn't because I was the chief executive officer, but I was not a shareholder. I was not the owner of the company. But it ended up being very much my decision because they, they were ready to back either, either or. And was it a simple decision? This no, it took way? me two weeks to, mm-hmm. to think through and say, okay, if I say we should sell, what happens then? Have I betrayed somebody? You know, I've been talking about going public and now suddenly I would change. And I said, if we say no, what happens then? What if we go public and we fail? And what if all our employees who have stock options who could have gotten a lot of money by selling the company get much less money if we go public? And have I then betrayed them? And so you, you have this difficult situation of thinking through your employees, your management team, your shareholders, the, you know, the founders and the VCs, the business partners. We had our customers, I was thinking through customers, you know, how will customers react? 
So you have to go through all that. And then you made a decision and they actually accepted your decision. So they did actually yeah. look at To be it. specific, uh, if a CEO says we should sell, then you must mm -hmm. sell. Because what is the other alternative? Would the VCs force you to not sell? Well, then you might not be a motivated CEO anymore. So you actually have that, that power you have. If I had said we shall not sell, and they could still have forced to sell it, but, but it does become important mm -hmm. for the VCs. So, Martin, so you had lots Anyhow, so, that was, so I didn't answer your question about yeah, yeah. how I made my choice, but I. Right. <laughs> but, uh, you know. <clears throat> You had so many much interaction with VCs. If you had a, a possibility to go back in time and tell yourself you're like 20 years younger, something about VCs and about just the company, would you change the way you got funding or you interacted with VCs or did you make some mistakes when getting capital from these people? That's, uh, that's a great question. With MySQL, I think one of the best things we did was how we picked our VCs. I think we had absolutely the best we could have. Mm -hmm. We started in, in Scandinavia in 2001, and we had VCs from Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And then in the B round, we got Benchmark and Index. And then in the C round, uh, IVP and some corporate investors. It was perfect execution. The board members were amazing. The VCs, absolutely the best in the world. Uh, but earlier in my life, if I could give myself advice, I would give a lot of advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, one piece of advice is VCs are not as important as you think. <clears throat> The, the press likes to write about the VCs and how famous they are and they know everybody and this guy was there and there and there and he knows this person, so that's why the deal happened. And sure, there is some degree of that, but let me remind you that entrepreneurs can survive without VCs, but VCs cannot survive without entrepreneurs. VCs have nothing other than being VCs. But entrepreneurs have an ability to run a business. And sure, you need funding to, to really scale it and grow it. So VCs are needed. But, but I think there's, we have we've glorified the VCs a little bit too much because they have nice cars. And if they're successful, they make a ton of money. But on average, VCs do not make a lot of money. Most VCs don't make money. It's the best VCs, the few who are best who make a lot of money. And that's why this industry, the VC industry has such a, a strong reputation. But in reality, there are many VCs who are not very successful, who are not very good, who don't really influence the company other than to the negative. So, mm -hmm. so we, as entrepreneurs, we can, we can feel strong and confident about our own role. Sure, you know, we fail and, and we are inexperienced and so on. And, and here comes the, the asymmetry of the situation. Every time you deal with a VC, for you it might be the first time you're dealing with a VC. For the VC, you are entrepreneur number 100. So they've learned how to deal with you, but they, you haven't learned how to deal with them. So that's why we get this respect for them. They look so professional. But it's just because they have a portfolio mindset and they go through many startups and they, they know how to sound really smart. And I'm not saying they aren't smart. I'm not trying to say VCs are not smart. I'm just saying that we shouldn't think that Silicon Valley is driven by VCs or anything is driven by VCs. The world is driven by people who create value, people who innovate and leaders of those who innovate. That's the core of everything. And the VCs are needed for and the VCs perhaps may make a lot of money and they have very nice offices and they have very nice cars and they don't work so long hours or something. But many of them do work. So, so that's, it's important to, to have that. You need to respect the VCs, but you need, must also be confident in your own abilities. So Martin, the last question related to the acquisition of uh, MySQL. Yeah. So it's... 
fascinating to understand. So there is this huge company, Sun Microsystems, and yes. it comes and acquires MySQL. And there is some kind, type of negotiation. So Sun Microsystems says, we'll give you $1 billion. And yes. MySQL says, we want $1.2 billion. Yeah. So the numbers which are, you know, yeah. the huge numbers, what's the dynamics of, of the negotiation? It uh, was very uh, unusual in this particular case. I think we spent three days or two days negotiating the price only. And the variation was practically zero. So MySQL had another offer, which was nearly a billion. Mm -hmm. And I told Sun, I said, I must tell you, Sun, we have an offer on the table, which is nearly a billion. And Sun called back the next day and said, we will offer you a billion. And I called back the next day and said, we would like to have some more. And they called back the next day and said, no. And I called back the, the same evening and said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm simplifying, but... But I, personally, I felt that we, we had a very uh, strong relationship with Sun and we had agreed early on to not play games with each other. We said, we will ask for what we need, you will ask for what we need, we won't ask for too much, we'll go straight for what's reasonable. No game playing, playing here. And it worked. That's how we negotiated in just two or three days. The contract was negotiated very quickly because... We had law firms who could have kept uh, negotiating forever, but we told them they, that they mustn't play any games. But put your best foot forward immediately, ask what you need, don't ask for more, but then expect the other side to give it to you if it's reasonable. And it really worked. So in that process, it reminded me of how many good people there are in the world and that you can conclude big deals when you have trust. And we had complete trust on both sides. And we lived up to our requirements, and they lived up to theirs. So I don't know how usual or unusual it is, but I think it's, it must go to the history as one of the sort of cleaner negotiations, because we, we didn't do any... You know, with some, in some situations you play good cop, bad cop, or the founder pretends to be furious, and how are you... In, how can you offend me with this low offer? We did none of that theater. When they came back and said, we are offering a billion, we knew that we were very close already. So Martin, so, so when you sold, sold uh, MySQL and you started working for Sun Microsystems, uh, you apparently had two choices, right? You could go back and become again an entrepreneur or you could stay within this corporate, U.S. corporate stru structure and yeah. become a CEO, a board member, you know, yeah. go the executive way. Have you ever given a thought about going like the executive way and not going to the entrepreneurship? Or for you, it was uh, very simple to go to a startup again. When we joined Sun in February of 2009, I joined with the purpose of staying a long time. I was a huge fan of sons, I felt that the people were great, it was a good place to land, they had treated us very well, so I had no plan of leaving. And maybe I had fooled myself, because my friends have told me, Martin, we knew you wouldn't stay there for too long. But I didn't, I really felt that I could be an executive at Sun for a long time, and I was excited about reviving the company and figuring out how to get it back to be a winner. So that, that's how I joined. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of you understood it was hard, you know, to change things. There came so. a day when I realized that Sun would never be successful again. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I just lost all my motivation. Although the MySQL business was doing well, but I, I couldn't see myself. I'm, I'm ready to fight a battle and I'm ready to join a company with lots of trouble. But I'm not ready to not see an opening in the future. Mm -hmm. Which brings us actually back to this, uh, you know, so you left uh, Sun Market Systems and yeah. you went to become an entrepreneur in residence yes. and then you decided to join Eucalyptus. So, so before joining Eucalyptus, were there any other directions or fields that you were looking at? Or there, you know, there were, but, but there's, what you should know about me is that 
as a business leader, I try to be very pragmatic and rational and unemotional and not sentimental. I say, I look at the facts and then I act. But when it comes to me deciding on my own career, I'm completely emotional. Mm -hmm. I'm not pragmatic. Uh -huh. so, so when I met with the Eucalyptus team, I was just so impressed by them that it washed away all everything else. And I felt that I don't care what, whether I have other alternatives and whether I should look at something else because it felt that I should be there. And, and so then I asked them if they would hire me. So sure, I had looked at other opportunities and I got job offers and so on, but but it wasn't it wasn't nearly as as rational as I am with everything else I do. Okay, so let's maybe uh, ask some funnier questions. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, actually, I've interacted with your uh, personal assistant, and she is great. And uh, mm -hmm. she said, "Martin is so busy, so busy," and then. She said, okay, so he had this list of uh, slots and you could have a breakfast with Martin at 7.30 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> yeah. So it was really interesting. I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your day. How do you start your day? Do you do breakfasts actually frequently with kind of business yeah. leaders? Okay, it's Stan, hard. first you should ask me, <laughs> was Tracy telling you the truth? <laughs> <laughs> because just as advice to CEOs, if you are not busy, ask your assistant to tell everybody that you are busy. <laughs> <laughs> But no, Tracy is wonderful and I am busy. <laughs> and 7.30 is perfect for breakfast because where I live, there's a breakfast place that opens at 7.30. And I get up at 6.00. So... 7.30 is perfect for breakfast and and you get it done and you are over with it and then you can do something else. So you, you like actually inviting pe people for breakfast because it's kind of, you, you, you have a conversation and then it's off and then you know you can do other well, stuff. <clears throat> I've had to learn now because there's so many people who want to meet with you that I must be very careful with how I, what I do. So, so I have to think for every meeting, I must think, okay, maybe this is just a telephone meeting. Maybe it's a meeting over coffee, maybe it's a meeting over breakfast, maybe it's a meeting over lunch, maybe it's a dinner. But many people come to me and say, Martin, can we meet for dinner because I would like to learn about your business? And I'm like, I don't have dinners, so many dinners, so I, I must adjust them to what I think is appropriate. And it's actually hard work. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's great to have a wonderful assistant who can do that. So I give her small signals on what, what's most <laughs> convenient for me. Because it, this is the worst thing for a CEO, is the time I spend. And every time I spend time on something other than eucalyptus, I feel bad because I should do eucalyptus work. Mm -hmm. Do you have particular advice on how do you keep this machine going? Like every day you have to have meetings and do things, so you have to keep yourself in shape. Do you go to sleep at a particular time, wake up, do you have lots of schedule, you know? Is, are there any secrets? Or advice My only use. secret is that I never give up. Mm -hmm. That I'm not very orderly. I can be sort of seasonal, meaning not seasonal, but, but sort of different, different days. I can have a day with 10 meetings and it's wonderful. And the next day I have no meetings and I'm not productive and I don't get stuff done. But I, you know, I start the morning with big ambitions, but I also always end the day by accepting myself for whatever I did that day. So I sort of, you, you, have to, you have to have a healthy appreciation of yourself and you have to be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be an egocentric guy, sort of focused on yourself, but you must give, cut yourself some slack. Because too many of us are too tight on ourselves and then we become tight with other people and we become unpleasant. So you, you must, even when you have sort of messed up a whole day and you didn't do anything productive. Once you go to bed, you must say, hey, it's life. I'm a great guy. You know, can't always be the best. Mm -hmm. And now just sleep a few hours and get going again. Mm -hmm. And actually, you mentioned that you actually receive up to 150 emails per day and you send out 50-100 emails per day. Yeah. So how do you manage to keep up with all of this, you know, different threads, Do you like respond right away or do you wait? I try to respond right away. 
<laughs> At MySQL, I had 200 emails per day, so it has actually gone down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm I become very critical, a critical observer of emails. And if somebody, if an email that I get doesn't on the subject line tell me what it is about, and on the first line tell me what the person wants to happen, then nothing will happen. I have no time to parse through the sort of the, the flow of your thinking. <laughs> you know, so some people write emails as if it's just their thinking flowing out, and I feel it's not my responsibility to parse it. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've become tougher with that. Mm -hmm. I used to try to respond to every email, but I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a you know, kind of funny question. Uh, mm -hmm. is about partying, parties. Yes. And uh, there was another interview where you said about one of the my <laughs> SQL founders. You said, I thought he was spoiling his life by not going to the parties and having fun, but just working and programming all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's interesting. So, maybe, so you actually had to work with these people who were like nerds, right? And uh, they were very like much software engineers and you were yeah. like outgoing person. And maybe you can tell a little bit about this. And also parties. You're saying that uh, doing lots of partying in the, when you are young actually helps you then later in your life or how, how this works? Well, I, uh, I think there are there's some things you must do early in life because if you do them later in life, it's much harder. Mm -hmm. and, and I've noticed that people who didn't party when they were young, they get an urge to do it when they are 40 or 45. And at that point, they are not as funny. And they they need more to get going. But when you're 20, anything is funny. And you just get together and it's a lot of fun. So I really urge people to do that when they are young, when they have the energy and the, the positive attitude. And I think it, it helps you in many ways that you will need later. Because when you do something unplanned and unprogrammed, you... You have to learn to deal with surprising situations. You have to deal with many people. You have to be funny. You have to think outside the box. There are many things you need in high tech that you actually can practice by being a young, irresponsible person party. Uh -huh. and, and you also learn sort of social confidence, what you can do and what you cannot do, and what happens when you do things. Like when we were students, we would get drunk and then we would do things and we would you know go and talk to people and ask them or suggest them crazy things it's amazing what people are ready to to believe and you realize that the world isn't as well defined as you would think that if you really have a great idea you can sell it to somebody and i think i actually think i learned that as a young student when we we did all these you know crazy things I think you know it's interesting that you mentioned that because there is an interview of Steve Jobs on the uh, internet where yeah. he says that it's very important to talk to people. So if you are doing this partying, you know, yeah. you are communicating with people. Which yeah. brings us to another question is, you know, you have this personal life and uh, you have the business life. And uh, when you sell... To somebody, you have to very quickly form some kind of a relation or connection with a person, and then when you're very young and like partying, and you have to make a connection to a pretty lady or the opposite thing, there's lots of. You think there's something in common in a lot? Enchant enchanting yes, a woman yes. or a, yeah. a man, whatever. Like and you're <laughs> building this open source company called MySQL, and everybody wants to acquire you. <laughs> So you think, how did the good-looking girls behave when I was a student? How did they manage, you know, supply and demand? <laughs> and it, it really works. Yeah, I, I think there are many similarities. Uh, and uh, it, it's an interesting question, actually. Yeah. So, uh, so how did you actually pick up your wife, right? Your family. <laughs> In, in a sense you that, are offending uh, her now. <laughs> she in a sense, up not, me. Not, not, not <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, not, but how did you choose her? How did you choose I, her? She, she chose me. I I, see. She made me think I chose her. I see. Yeah. Uh, any qualities uh, <laughs> that you think are important for you know in your spouse or in your family to help with your business? You know anything that you're looking for 
you know, in, in relation? No, I actually think I've been very fortunate in, in having a, a supportive wife who has allowed me to focus so so solely on work. But I, at the same time, I do not think they are necessarily related. I, w- I would not think about uh, family life from that perspective. Mm-hmm. I would just, you know, you you do what you do and you then you, you figure out there are many ways to make things work so i, I wouldn't so you think it's they're separate you just you just keep them separate no, but because separate. what would the other alternative be that young entrepreneurs would go out and look for <laughs> wives who fulfill some <laughs> criteria <laughs> that would be pathological <laughs> you know, i think you should marry the one you fall in love with and that's it exactly that's it. if it is mutual <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that. Uh, another great question, I think, about books. Books. Yeah. Um, so you really mm. read uh, lots of books. I do. Uh, right. And does it come from your family, from your parents? Uh, this, you know, that you read a lot. Uh, it's it's your your actually, you know. Yeah. I I've, um, I've always read books, and I've always loved reading. And what people may not know is that when I was younger, I wasn't necessarily as outgoing as I am now. And I spent a lot of time reading. So, you know, I found at home books by Bertrand Russell, and I read them when I was 12 or 13. And maybe I understood every fifth page or something, but I was really intrigued by them. So... Would you recommend any books to young entrepreneurs? Yes, I would, and I have. There are some books that Absolutely, you must read to be a good entrepreneur. Uh, Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore was written in the 80s and it's completely valid still today. Uh, if you don't read Peter Drucker, you will not be successful. Um, uh, Jim Collins, is that his name? Good to Great and How the Mighty Fall and a few others. Um, Guy Kawasaki, The Art of the Start. It's a great book. Um, and there are more. You can read uh, Richard Branson's book, Screw It, Let's Do It. It's a great one. But there are many. Then you can read about Southwest Airlines. Um, what's the name of the book? <laughs> Herb Kelleher's book on, on Southwest Airlines. Just very funny. Um, yeah. Steve Blank just is, uh, wrote his new book, and I'm reading it. And it's sort of—it's not a book you read from start to end. It's more like a, an encyclopedia where you go in and look for specific advice. So it's a very good collection. Of Steve actually spoke highly of you when he was here on just a couple of weeks ago, speaking oh, right on your. Yeah. Phone. Otherwise, he's smart. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, you should le- read uh, No Fear or Bess Stracha, uh, the book where I wrote a, a chapter uh, written by my good friend Pekka Viljakainen, who is an advisor to the Skolkova Foundation. That book is now available in English, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Swedish, Finnish, all kinds of languages. Anything you would recommend for sort of just to relax, not about particular business life, but... Or to relax? It, uh, anything about, you know, just to maybe learn on, on the experience, not particular on the entrepreneurship, but something that would that would kind of form you, you know, your character or would lead you to some ideas. E- yes, but that, the answer is everything. So I read books on cosmology. I read books on brain and how the brain works. I read books on sociology. I just read uh, Kahneman's this thinking fast, thinking slow. That was really a hard read. I mean, he's a scientist and he writes like a scientist. But at the same time, it's such a good book. So you must read it. But it takes time to read it. And now I'm reading. And then I just finished the book uh, about immigration. Uh, exceptional people. Mm-hmm. About how in the world, the world has been shaped by people who have moved to other countries. And then I'm reading... Um, the better angels of our... You know, when I say like this and I don't remember the title of the book, then you know I'm reading it on the Kindle. Because when I read a physical book, every time I pick up the book, I see the title and it gets stored in my brain. On the Kindle, when you open a book, you never see the title again. You never see the the front page. And you, you don't know who wrote it or what the title was or what it looks like. You just know the text. It's It's weird. 
<clears throat> but but there are many. And if you are really interested in, I always tweet about good books I read. And maybe you don't want to read all my tweets, but I made it super easy for you. If you go to my blog on eucalyptus.com, I, I publish summaries of my tweets. And in my summaries, I categorize them. So there's one header called books I've read recently. So you'll actually find all the books I've read if I like them. I read some books that I didn't like, and then I won't mention them to you. But books I've liked, I, I mentioned them. But I think human beings should read books, more books than you can imagine. And I'm sort of drawing this uh, inspiration from something I've never seen in real life. But everybody claims that when you travel in Russia, even the taxi drivers are reading books all the time. I don't think it's true, because first of all, there are no taxis in Russia, they're just illegal services. <laughs> I'm sorry. Of course there are taxis, but, but there are former security guards from the KGB who are driving around. They don't read books. But, but I'm sort of thinking that whether it's true or not, that is the style, meaning you should always read books. You should have a book with you every moment. And the moment you stand in the security line, instead of swearing and being upset and talking to the others, read a book. You can read five pages by the time you get to the, the security check. And, and you can read much more than, than we ever thought a human being can read. And it's, it's very refreshing. So I, that's something I would recommend to, to everybody. Whether you read... Mm -hmm. Fiction or non-fiction, or whether you know, it doesn't matter whether it's good literature mm -hmm. or bad literature. I think reading is a vital thing to keep human beings alive. So, Martin, you actually mentioned interesting that you are interested in how the brain works, mm. how your mind works. Yeah. Uh, are you interested in things like psychology or analyzing yourself? You know, there are things like people, you know, trying to figure out how their brain works. You know. Uh, such not things, really. not really. Uh, but you're interested in the in how people think, yes. Right? How we, we think. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned cosmology, yes. Right. So you're interested about the universe. Uh, I think it's the most exciting thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And when I was a boy, I was thinking, does the universe end? And if it ends, what comes after that? And uh, when you are young, you can spend weeks just thinking about it, and you get nowhere. And so I, I'm still excited by those questions. And not that I understand all of it, but, but it's amazing how a question that you really cannot even grasp, how it can capture your imagination, and it's just very exciting to read. And I read about, you know, is, do we have an inflationary universe, and is it expanding or not? To mm -hmm. me, that's, that's more exciting than, than mm -hmm. any, any Stieg Larsson book. Mm -hmm. Uh, so actually, you touched on uh, Russia. Yes. And it was very interesting. I looked through your tweets, and uh, there were lots of things about Russia. And you tweeted about business and entrepreneurship in Russia. But you also seem to be a little interested in politics in Russia. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and all of the stuff which is going It's very... So... Uh, what is, what is the origin of your interest in Russia? You seem to be, you know... I, don't, I, I think if you travel to Russia, you cannot help but falling in love with that place. Mm -hmm. That sounds like my phone ringing over there or somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Russia can be the ugliest place in the world. It can be the most dysfunctional place in the world. In the world, it can be the most corrupt place in the world. But beyond that, it's a very intriguing, exciting place. So... So I, I worked, I, when I was young, I took on the role of being an export manager to Russia. I didn't speak any Russian, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it would be an exciting adventure, and it was. And I really, it was the time of the, the, the coup, and just, you know, two weeks after the coup, we were doing an IT seminar at the Mossoviet in Moscow um, for them. So it was really great. And after that time, just, I just liked the place. And I am a little bit Russian, I'm a 16th Russian myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm explaining it by, by that. But it's just a fascination with, with a place that is so, you know, s full of so many contrasts and contradictions. Mm -hmm. And you are also, I think, some, somewhat involved with Skolkovo Foundation. You, you're no, not. No, no. Uh, 
do you think that uh, so they, they're trying to kind of you know import entrepreneurship from Silicon Valley to Russia? Do you think uh, it's easy, or I mean, what do you think about the entire idea? I think for Finland it would be also the same, right? Many countries are trying to you know take whatever. I don't think Finland and Russia are the same. <laughs> the least. Uh -huh. No, I, I really mean it. Uh -huh. They are neighboring countries, but they are diametrically different mm -hmm. in so many ways. There are few areas where, mm -hmm. I mean, Finns respect Russians, and Russians, I hope, respect Finns, but there isn't much in common. Mm -hmm. Like, R Russians are romantic people. Finns are not. Russians care about what, what it looks like, they care about fashion. Finns don't. You know, Russians, when they come to Finland, say, Why are people dressed so poorly? And they're right. The, the best dressed people in Finland are Russians. <laughs> because they care about it. But Finns don't. So that's, and these are just some examples. There are so many differences. But I, you know, I think it's a huge mistake to think that you can import Silicon Valley entrepreneurialism anywhere in the world. We must know that Silicon Valley is unique in the world. And it's an anomaly. And trying to mimic it anywhere else is bound to fail. You can only be an entrepreneur in your own way. And you must have strong determination to do it, and then it can happen. And, and I don't think Russia has very good odds here, mm -hmm. to be honest. There's very little tradition that would, that would indicate strong entrepreneurialism in Russia. You know, there's not a good history of ownership of real estate and property. There's not a good history of openness or, or equity or egalitarianism. Uh, there, is, there is not a good history of companies that grow that aren't government owned or controlled. So sort of it's tough, I would assume, I'm not Russian, but I would assume it's tough for an entrepreneur to get going for that lack of, of all the background things. But that's why I'm so happy about Yandex and Mail.ru mm -hmm. and and uh, Kaspersky Labs and all these. So I think that the internet actually can bring it and make it happen. But I don't know. You know, you tell me. Many of you are from there, so you know better than I do. But this is my observation. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm afraid that's Kolkova. I've seen these projects. You know, if you re really take a step back and say... Can you see a difference between Skolkovo and something that Gosplan produced in the <laughs> 70s? And, 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 and what, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying, how do you know that it isn't sort of a centrally governed place where politicians get to shine and they can shake hands with famous Americans? Because that's not what entrepreneurialism is about. It's about allowing really brilliant, inexperienced people build amazing things and giving them a market and giving them a place, a protected place to grow. If that happens, I will be in full support and it will be fantastic. But, but I don't think there's a, there isn't a tradition of letting that happen. Which actually brings us to another question. Um, it's very interesting that there are so many uh, entrepreneurs in open source field coming from Scandinavia, in particular from Finland. Yes. Right? It's a tiny country. Finland is a tiny country. Mm -hmm. So... So, for instance, for MySQL, do, do you think the Finnish culture helped uh, MySQL at the very beginning somehow? Because when it was a very yeah, yeah. tiny, tiny thing. I used to say no. In the beginning, people asked me, I said, no, it's just a coincidence. But now, knowing that Linux came from Finland, MySQL mm -hmm. came from Finland, SSH came from Finland, and IRC came from Finland, a country with 5 million people, so the size of St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. So then you say, okay. Finland is an open country, an egalitarian country, and a highly technical country. And those things may apply here. And then the fact that education is completely free. So you get this thing that I'm learning this for free, maybe I should give it away for free. And that's actually where I think the strength of Russia is that Russia has a good university education program, and I understand that it's mostly free. I don't know anymore. But mm -hmm. that's Officially. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you know, 
When a Russian says officially, it means no. <laughs> it means, or it means the opposite. <laughs> uh, right. Let's go back to to the you know to business. Talking about business yeah. a little bit. So, yeah. can you share with us uh, what was the most difficult decision that you had to make? Uh, you know, in in your business career. Uh, I wonder if that. So, I don't know which one was the most difficult. It was difficult to decide to sell my SQL to Sun, uh, but once I did it, I felt good about it. And what about Eucalyptus? And if, you, if you can share, yeah, Some I way. probably wouldn't share yet because it's it's happening. We we haven't had really difficult decisions, but I've learned that <clears throat> when we talk about difficult decisions, I've identified two different types of difficult decisions. We had a difficult decision at MySQL when we chose between Warburg Pincus, Kleiner Perkins, and Benchmark as our investors. And I've now learned that when you have this, that you have two or three alternatives that, who are all good, then it isn't so much of a problem. You can choose any and you will be fine. It's difficult because you are afraid that you are leaving something good on the table because you can just re choose one of them. But then there's the other sort of difficult decision, which is a decision where you do not have choice, but you don't like it. Meaning, there's an obvious thing you must do, but, but you are not willing to admit that this is your only choice. And maybe my scale when we sold to Sun, maybe that was a situation where we, well, we had two offers, but, but maybe it was so obvious with that offer that we had to take it, and which made it difficult for me because I realize that if I'm just rational, if I only think about money and why would a CEO not think about money, then we should just sell. But but I brought in all those emotional sides to it. So what about patents? What's you what is your view on patents? So you're working in open flow and my scale had no patents and uh, you mentioned that uh, Eucalyptus also doesn't have uh, currently right doesn't have any patents. So so can you can you elaborate on that a little so, bit? What's what's <clears throat> yes. On patents, I am talking about software patents. Right, I'm not right, right, talking right. about anything else. But I think software patents are detrimental to the world, to companies, to the industry, to everything. I do not think they do anything good. MySQL did have patents. And I believe that as long as patents are software patents are legal and possible, you may need to have them for your own protection. So you shouldn't be so naive as to not have them just because you are opposed to them. It's like if we would all start agreeing that we should ban handguns in the United States. I think we should hold on to them until everybody agrees. Um, so I think, I think software patents do not produce value. I've been talking about this three gazillion uh, problem. First, the company spends one gazillion in acquiring patents just for defensive purposes. Uh, then their shareholders look at them and say, why are you not using the asset that you have? So then they start spending a gazillion on trying to license those patents to others because they think they have an asset that they must start selling. So then they've lost two gazillion dollars. And then after that, a patent troll, meaning somebody who doesn't have any production of their own, comes with a lawsuit for a patent and they have to pay a third gazillion to fight that lawsuit. And they can't use their existing patents as defense because the patent troll has no business of their own that you could attack. So you end up spending three gazillion and having gained absolutely nothing. And I'm hoping that there will be some really expensive patent battle between some really wealthy big companies because that will demonstrate to the whole world how uh, dangerous they are, how improductive. The purpose of patents were, were to protect the innovator. The one with an invention was given a monopoly on the invention so that it would make sense to make inventions. But in the software world, we have already shown that that's not the case. People innovate in software anyhow, and an innovation in software is not very large, meaning you don't need to spend many years doing it. You have to spend many years becoming good at it, but no single uh, invention in software is so much large that it would need a patent protection. Copyright is a very good protection for software. That's all we need when we talk about software. Mm -hmm. 
That's my view. So, Martin, do you do things like defensive publications or people, you know, just publish things just for other people not be able to patent or things? At Eucalyptus, Eucalyptus, we Eucalyptus. were the first private cloud software pat- uh, uh, platform, private cloud software platform in the world, and we released it as open source code. Yeah. So, yes, we are doing it, in essence, and we are sharing it with everybody. Uh, in your past did you have significant problems with somebody suing you or you know threatening to sue for, for patents we had one company who came to my sql once and said uh, i work in the patent licensing uh, group and i would like to discuss with you a patent licensing deal for you dear my sql and we say why would you like to discuss that with us and he said well maybe you would benefit from some of our patents maybe you even would need some of our patents and we said oh which ones do we need and they said well we don't want to go into details <laughs> <laughs> and we said well why should we then discuss and they said well let's sign an nda and we will discuss and we said we are happy to sign an nda but the existence of the discussions and the patent number of any patents being mentioned in the discussions those two things must be excluded from the nda but otherwise the air uh, company were very happy to sign an nda with you and they went away they never came back but how mm-hmm. dangerous was it who knows mm-hmm. i i actually think generally speaking that mysql was protected by uh, popularity Our product was so widely used that anybody who would have brought a patent suit against us would have challenged their own customers. So it would have been an I I could imagine that some thought that saw that it was an would have been an unwise move because MySQL was so popular. But not every open source software has that benefit, and I think specifically open source software should be have protection because it's amazing innovation that happens when the code is open and everybody can contribute and we need to protect that and i would love for for legislation to protect it but it doesn't mm-hmm. and actually a follow up question i think you mentioned during one of your interviews that mysql actually got sued you know when you first got to the states you yeah. got paper yeah. served yeah um So what is your thinking about the US legal system? Does it actually help entrepreneurs, you know, all of this lawsuits and does it have to be reformed? Uh, uh, I'm not sure I have an opinion on the legal system in general or, or lawsuits here, but I'm I'm much less critical than when I came. You know, it's so typical for us Europeans. We come here to the US with all kinds of prejudice. We, we think we know what America is and how it works and how it doesn't work. And then we complain about everything, everybody suing everybody and so on. But I must say that when MySQL got sued, the treatment we got by the court and the whole system was excellent. There was nothing to complain in there. We could complain about the other side and what they did. But the system was not at flaw. The system worked well. So, so I don't... I don't so, know. Mm-hmm. so let's actually ask a funny question. So it's probably something which everybody asks you. But I, I thought don't... software patterns was funny. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, the you you actually shave your head for release, right? Or for your software mm-hmm. developers? How this happened? And so, uh, so at Eucalyptus, we had we developed a very significant new release, and it was delayed and delayed. So at one okay. point, I went to the engineers and say. You guys, you can't ship software on time. And I said, Martin, we will <laughs> ship now. Now we will ship it on time. I said, I don't believe you. <laughs> and then they said, okay, what do we get if we ship on time? What do we get? And I'll tell you now the whole story. I said, guys, if you can ship on time, I will dance naked on State Street in Santa Barbara. <laughs> it will be so important. <laughs> and they said, could you not do it? <laughs> So then I said, okay, if you ship ahead of time, you can shave my head. And they shipped a week ahead of the deadline that we had agreed. Mm-hmm. And on that day, they dragged me out in the backyard of our office, sat me down in a chair, and started <laughs> shaving my head. But, but then in the back of my head, they left the, the eucalyptus logo. 
So, <laughs> so for two months, I walked around looking like, probably like a, a gang member or something. You know, I'm, I'm not a small guy. And then with my head completely shaven, but in the back, there's this funny looking E. So that's, that was the story. It's coming back now, you see. I'm happy about my hair that it's growing back. Actually, today, uh, Eucalyptus 3.1 beta is available as source code, so please download it. And I did not have to have my hair shaved. Or I, I'm not in Santa Barbara today. Maybe that's what rescued me. So just uh, another question is about your... Uh, you know, role models. You mentioned several businessmen that you like. In particular, you like a person from Salesforce, Mark Benioff. Yes. He's a great guy. Why do you think he's a great guy? What, what features, you know, what uh, things about him you like? I like Mark Benioff because his mind is limitless. He can think about anything and everything. He can think about scenarios and bold plans or other plans. He can maintain multiple chess games in his head at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Uh, then he is a very funny and personable guy and very helpful. Mm -hmm. So he's helping others, he's helping society, which I think is great. And then the CEO and entrepreneur in me loves the fact that when I heard about Mark Benioff for the first time, people said, oh yes, Mark won't really last long as a CEO of Salesforce. He was good at starting it, but we don't think he will succeed. And a CEO loves to hear that, that it's sort of you succeed despite the predictions of other people. Okay, so I think that it's time for us to take some questions from the audience. Uh, maybe, you know, you guys can think a little bit. And in the meantime, uh, there is actually, there was another question which, which I liked. Uh, there was this Tweet, you tweeted uh, these 12 entrepreneurship rules, and then you said, okay, out of those 12 rules, you like three. One rule is listen, second is give credit, and third is be yourself. So listen is quite an interesting rule, right? In the sense that you have to listen to your employees, what they tell you. It's, it's very important uh, to keep very good contact and relations with your you know, people you work with. Yeah. So you are just very approachable. For instance, uh, you know, Steve Jobs had this uh, thing where each, each week he would have like a three hour meeting with all of his like top level employees and he would just talk and talk and talk to people. Uh, how do you manage to contact, a contact with your employees without uh, them becoming too, without you becoming too approachable, right? Because yeah. you have limited time. So I would first of all say that I need to do more of this. You know, the fact now that I am so much out in the market means that I'm not spending enough time with our employees. So I, I need to do more of it. But, but I think that the advice on listening applies to any situation. And I've seen so many times when we are entrepreneurs and we go talk to a customer, we're so proud of what we have done. So we, we sort of, we are, we like to force down the message to the customer. The customer tries to ask another question, but we just go back to our slide because we must present our slide. And it's so wrong. When the customer gives you a signal, you must listen and you must take action. If the customer says, I agree with you, what should you do? Move to the next slide. <laughs> Don't stay on the slide. They already bought it. But everybody makes these mistakes. I see it over and over again. The customer is trying to signal something, but the seller or the marketer isn't listening, but is sort of forcing his message. And I see it with entrepreneurs, because many entrepreneurs come to me with their business plans and say, Martin, can you comment on our business plan? I said, sure. And I comment on my business plan. And then they argue back. I'm like, guys, I don't need to argue with you. It's your business plan. I'm giving you my feedback. Take it and thank for it. But why do you argue with me? <laughs> they, but they cannot receive the information. They must, they must prove to themselves that they are right by trying to convince me. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, that, I'm not that interested in your business, but I try to give some honest feedback and you can take it or not. So I just realized that it, 
you know, a fast path to success is to listen and and ask yourself every time, why is this person saying this thing? And after the meeting, you sit down and say, and what did they not say? And this is a learning by Peter Drucker. He says, the most important thing in communication is what's not getting said. So you think back at the interaction with the customer and say, they never said such and such. And then you know there's a very strong reason for it. They didn't want to tell you, or they don't think so, or they really think, you know, that it means something when they don't say something to you. <clears throat> like we ask customers, do you like this? I say, yeah, I don't like it really a lot. That actually means I don't like it. Because they are just trying to please you, and you must listen to them. You realize that they didn't give a reason for why they like it, which actually means that they don't. And I once I did a presentation on behalf of Eucalyptus for a big bank six months ago. And sometimes I come in and I'm a little bit sort of, I'm thinking, they won't be interested anyhow. But I presented and they were really excited, there were lots of questions. So I, so I asked at the end, I said, so, okay, so now just openly, I gave my presentation. Did you think it was interesting and useful for you? Yes, Martin, excellent presentation. We really loved it. And I said, do you really, really mean it? Because, you know, I'm European, so you can tell me directly. And, and we don't need to spend time on this, but if you really like it, then let me know and I'll engage our people. I said, yes, we love this. This is so right for our bank. This guy will follow up with you. I haven't heard from him. <laughs> <laughs> so... So I'm just realizing that, that listening really to the weak signals and what's not being said is important. So you do it with your, you must do it with your employees, but you can do it with everybody. And they always have a message for you. So any questions from the audience? Yes, your question is uh, <coughs> kind of continuing that line with, uh, with MySQL. Yeah. Uh, I believe mean, you know you you you're still watching what uh, what where the MySQL is now. So uh, let's put it this way: uh, if you were a CEO till now, was it the same course as it, as it is now, or something different? Ah, uh, good question. <coughs> I'm afraid they are doing a better job at product development. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Oracle is doing a wonderful job on engineering with MySQL. I think they are doing a wonderful job job selling it because they are increasing prices and they are forcing customers to pay more, which sort of makes sense if you are Oracle. What they are not doing is they are not dealing or engaging with the open source community as they did. They do it a little bit, but they don't do it, ne do it nearly as much or as seriously as we did it. And they don't care about business partners. At, as MySQL AB, we had many other companies who had integrated their products with ours, and they had a great business, and that's not continuing. So, so they, some of the business partners have suffered for that reason, and the community activity has moved outside of Oracle. But if you just look at engineering work, MySQL is in better shape than it has ever been. It would be in better shape also if I were the CEO, but, but they've really stuck to that. They have a great VP of engineering, um, they're doing a good job, they release on time, they have good features, good performance. Uh, so that's great news for everybody. So, coming to the question, yeah. if, uh, if it's so, do you see some kind of, not even also, but at least common uh, successful business model for a company providing open source? Exactly, business model. Mm. Because, okay, we, can, uh, we have Red Hat in the billion range. We have yeah. Postgres not, a, not that successful as it could be. So, the range, the range could be. Well, yes. So, first of all, I would say open source is a production and distribution method, nothing else. It is not a business model. There are certain business models that perhaps work better with open source, but from a scientific perspective, perspective, they are unrelated, meaning one thing is producing open source software and one thing is building a business. Uh, I think we are seeing now that the best models are 
subscription-based businesses, business models, where you add some feature or benefit or service to the commercial offering that you do not provide uh, in the open source release. And that's how Red Hat operates. That's Sugar CRM, Acquia, Alfresco, all these open source companies who are growing and doing well, uh, talent, they all follow that model. They have different variations of it, but that's the, the main model around it. We learned at MySQL that support was not a sufficient business model. Support is good if you are creating a lifestyle business for yourself, but not, not if you're building a growth company. You must have a scalable, differentiated business model. And that's what leads us to this conundrum that sometimes to build a good open source business, you must deviate a little from some open source principles. But in the long run, that is what is useful for open source because open source needs funding. Open source needs money to function. There's no company like MySQL that had so many developers of GPL code as a proportion of the size of the company. Others have more of them, but in proportion to our size, we had more than anybody else. And we funded it ourselves. And how did we fund it? Because we had a functioning business model. So I very much believe that you must take responsibility for the business model, and then you channel a lot of that back into open source, but you also give paying customers something that non-paying customers don't get. Why would you otherwise pay? Uh, so you just answered my first question. My second was, uh, for what kind of project do you recommend the open source model and uh, why do you choose it for database? Database seems, for MySQL, it was always closed software and it's very expensive software. So why, when do I recommend open source? I think open source is a superior way to develop software. So I will always recommend it. Whatever you do, do it open source. Why wouldn't you? Don't you want to create the best software? No, from the business point of view. <laughs> There's a business. There's a business with open source. Always. But you must have a mindset which many people do not have. There are many CEOs who will not agree to be CEO of an open source company because you have to deal with difficult intellectual challenges. Like, how are you a CEO and you love those who pay you nothing as much as you love those who pay you? And how do you share your love? I have no problem doing it, but I know many people are capable CEOs who just <coughs> cannot handle it. They would only serve one of the groups. And you must have this sort of combination of compassion and detachment at the same time. You must be compassionate with everybody who's using your product. But you must also be detached as to whether they are paying or not. If you get upset when somebody is not paying you, then <laughs> you'll be frustrated in no time and you'll stop. So you must have this conviction and, and belief that everything will work out. And at MySQL, we had a thousand non-paying users for every paying customer. And we were just smiling. Although some big customers never paid us anything. Omniture in Utah, 7,000 uh, MySQL instances, I think. They never paid us anything. And there was a moment I thought, why don't you pay? That's unfair. But you can't think like that because we had chosen to make it open source and they had chosen to make use of it. So we should just be happy. But you must have that inner conviction. and Then you should do it. But if you don't believe in open source, then don't. You can be your next Microsoft. And I want to like to hear your opinion on how to large staff distinctions that the telecom do deal with some. How do they continue to innovate? I think it's all about people. I don't think there are industries that don't innovate. I think there are people who stop innovating. And there are leaders who tolerate it. And they shouldn't. And I think that's one of the strengths of Steve Jobs. I mean, he wasn't strong in all areas and he wasn't necessarily a 
a beloved leader in some ways, but he had that strictness about innovation. He would not tolerate lack of innovation. And that's, that's an important leadership quality that, that few leaders have. But I would blame it on the leaders. And maybe we can blame it on labor unions, because if you go to those leaders, they'll say, well, I would make changes, but the labor union and the trade union agreements prevent me. And maybe there's some truth to that. There are some structural issues. But mostly it's about people. Thank you for your answer. You said that follow up on that. When do you see the way the board, and what have been doing about the boards here, and where are they in these companies in this innovation, and watch their market share hemorrhage over five years, six years? No big company goes out of business overnight. So you talked about leadership. What do you see the board in this? So I represent the European school of thinking where the board of a company is the holder of the strategy. So it defines the strategy. And to execute the strategy, it hires and fires CEOs. In reality, of course, the CEO is often the one proposing a strategy, and that's fine. But it's the board that owns the strategy. And if the strategy is flawed, then the board is flawed. If the CEO is the wrong CEO, then you should blame the board, not the CEO. And, and it worries me sometimes that in the press people complain about bad CEOs. But hey, we are all doing the best we can. If our boards don't understand to kick us out, then it's their fault, not our fault. So I think it's, it's misguided to blame something on a bad CEO. There are bad CEOs, but, but they have boards who should release them from their duties when it's time. And most boards don't. Oh, not most, but many boards don't. So I... I agree that those boards are not handling the, the duty that they have. This is why I can, just as flavor here, for the longest time, I was not a member of the MySQL AB board. I was the CEO. I was so happy to be just the CEO. I said, board, you're dependent on me anyhow. You don't need me as a member. I will come there, I'll propose strategies and stuff, but I want you to make decisions, and then I feel the, the support from you. Only in the last two years where I was I a, a member of the MySQL AB board. Now I'm a member of the Eucalyptus board because that's a tradition in the US. If I'm not, everybody would ask why I'm not. But I would actually be fine with the European model where the CEO is the executive officer and the board uh, is the holder of the strategy. The second time I'm listening to you, and there's two parts of those smiles. One part has your thoughts and your friends, and the second part, you take decisions there through the information or the culture. How do you get these two teams get together? Who do you support and do you have your application in your hand? How do you do it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it as a conflict. I don't. Being rational doesn't, isn't the same as being cold. And partying doesn't mean that you are warm. Meaning you are just yourself, and you are who you are. And you make decisions, and you can have fun. Uh, I don't know. I, I sort of, I don't understand the question. I understand the question, but I, <laughs> I don't understand the, con I don't think it is a question. <laughs> Um, I'd like to come back to a question about open source. So you said billion and mm -hmm. But can you give, I don't know, two, three reasons why it should be open source versus proprietary research? Because, you know, lots of companies, particularly uh, big companies, they shy yeah. away from open source. Yeah. As soon as they hear open source, oh, no. There's no support, no maintenance. Yeah. First of all, is it really true? I can Two yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a non-answer to this one as well. I can't convince people about open source. Just like if somebody came to me and said, Martin, why should, should I surf? And if I tell them how wonderful it is to surf, not that I do it, but it doesn't help them. Unless they believe it's fun to surf on the big waves, they will not be successful doing so. And it is with open source that many people don't believe in it, and that's fine. We will always have closed source software. We will always have companies who will not use open source software. But I'm thinking for myself, I don't care. 
if we are few people in open source, it will make me even more successful. I'll have less to compete with. Mm -hmm. And if not all, all companies use open source, so what? Because the leading ones do. If you look at the most innovative companies on this planet, they are all using open source software. So over time, it will happen. Google is a big user of open source software. Amazon is a big user of open source software. Netflix, whichever innovative, Salesforce.com, Workday, all of Facebook, all of those leaders of innovation are using it. Microsoft. And Microsoft, even Microsoft. So it, it obviously makes sense among those, among the leaders. And when that happens, I sort of say, isn't that enough? Who cares about the followers? Who cares about the laggards? When the leaders are really into it. So there is no better worse. It's basically a matter of personal belief. I think there's better and worse. I think closed source is worse. And I think it has been shown. If you look at Coverity and the other companies who do uh, source code reviews, and they find out that closed source software has seven to ten, ten times more vulnerabilities than open source. That to me is proof. And my example is, you go to a pizzeria and you order a pizza, and the wall to the kitchen is open, and you see the, kick, the cooks there, how they turn the, the dough and they make the pizza, and you love it because you see it and you see your pizza coming. If there's a wall and you can't see it, what do they do? Cigarette in their mouth, <laughs> dirty hands. You have no idea. <laughs> and they know that if they smoke a cigarette, you won't know. So even if just a few of them are like that, on average, closed source pizzas are worse than open source pizzas. I'm curious, when it comes to each scale, which has been the most painful time for scaling up? Is it the germination to getting your first sale? Is it the first sale to the first hundred? Is it the finality? <laughs> and the second question is, what are your triggers for knowing when to take them? So when is it painful to scale? Well, which is it, the most yeah. painful section? It could be any time. And, you know, we CEOs... We are equipped with sort of uh, self-correcting features. We can go through the most painful phase, and then we win one great customer. We don't remember the pain anymore. It's gone. You know, if we really think, we say, okay, going to the dentist can be painful, but we don't really remember it. So, so when I think back, and when is it painful... I think, for me personally, I know when, when I, I, I... It's not easy to stress me. And I have good nerves. So I can take a lot of uncertainty. But I do know what is stressful for me. It is when I spin too fast. And I did it in the spring of 2003, when we raced the B run for my scale, and we were moving. I was moving my family to the Bay Area. At that point, in May, this time of the year, I remember my chairman and good friend said, Martin, I see on you, you are going too fast. You are not yourself. Your movements are a little bit shaky. You are not concentrating. You're not mindful. I can see that you're sort of, you're losing the grip on, on the business. And he was right. But that's the, the pathological part of human beings, that when we feel it, we say, okay, I have to work even harder to get over it. So you can become get into a vicious circle where you work too hard and then you think you have to work even harder to get out of it, which you don't. So that, that's, that is a stress, and it can happen at any time. It can happen because you didn't hire enough people around you or because you did hire people around you and you need to work with them or because suddenly three major initiatives are happening at the same time or suddenly nothing happens and you have the emptiness or whatever it is. So, so I don't think there's a specific stage, but this is the moment, you know, you, you undulate up and down. There are times when you are, you are relaxing a little bit and gathering uh, uh, energy, and then are times when you are maxing out and you start feeling it. That, that is a stressful time. And, 
And if you're a CEO, you're a single point of failure. Anybody else in the company can freak out and the others can say, okay, he freaked out, he'll be back in a few weeks. But the CEO is always on duty. There is no spare backup for the CEO. So that's why the CEO is the most critical part of a company. Not because of the decision he makes, but just because there's just one CEO. Sure, you could say there's just one CTO but, but you, or something like that, but there is more uh, variability there and, and you can replace somebody. But the CEO is always always on duty and that's why it makes it stressful. In the second part of the question, the question is how, when do you know, when is the right time to come? When do you know which story to do? Uh, yeah. Is it pain or is there a general metric in your business that you're looking for? What are kind of your reasons for taking money? Well, a good rule is take money when you can, not when you need. But that's a little bit of an arrogant piece of advice because you may not have the luxury of that situation. <laughs> <laughs> so then you need to raise money before it's too late. Be a little bit more. The problem is. Uh, Startup CEO, a growth CEO must think very, think in terms of opportunities. This can be huge. But when he makes or she makes his financial projections, you have to be a little bit sober and say, okay, maybe we don't do as well as we thought. And then we may run out of money in six months. If we run out of money in six months, we need to raise money now. Yeah, I would say so. I think you can do open source whatever you do. But I'm not going to try to convince you because it's not clear that if you switch to open source that you would be more successful because maybe you don't understand it or maybe you don't care about it or maybe you wouldn't do it the right way or maybe it requires other changes. So, so I'm not going to state that I know what you specifically should do but, but I will claim that I, I don't think there's any business where you couldn't use open source. Yeah. I earned my most money when I made open source software. I, I earned very little when I did closed source. But, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not saying it will work for everybody. I'm just saying there's no categorical reason uh, to not consider open source for whatever you do. Anybody could do. There's a way to build <coughs> Apple's whole business with open source software. They chose not to. They chose to close the software. But there's a way of building it with open source software, I believe. <coughs> okay, last question. Sorry, uh, um, during the first round of China, how did you structure your valuation? And what are the important factors that affect that? So on valuation. Just one more. Yeah. During the last, uh, during acquisition, yeah. one of the factors were affecting that acquisition in the price. How yeah. do you determine the price? What oh, of the acquisition. Well, first, of, first round of finance, then you got Series A, B, then you got market value, and then yeah. obviously acquisition. So I'm trying to understand how open source affects, you know, pre market value, and what are the factors were affecting? Okay, good question, but I don't think MySQL uh, is an indication of what matters for open source. I don't think it's generic. But I can tell you that MySQL, in 2001, when we were raising the first round, we, were, we signed a term sheet for 15 million euro pre-money. And back then, 50 million euro was 50 million dollars. And how did we come to 50 million when the company had done... 700,000 in sales the year before. Uh, well, we, we talked to VCs and we said, so how much would you offer? And one VC said 10 million and one said 50. And I said, okay, seems like we could get 50. Uh, well, then, as we discussed here, MySQL got sued by an American company. It happened three days after the term sheet had been signed. 
any smart VCs would have pulled out then and said, sorry guys, this changes the picture. So to preempt that, we decided very quickly to cut our valuation in half. And we went back to the VCs and said, hey, good news, bad news situation. Bad news is we just were sued in the US. Good news, you'll get twice as many shares for the company uh, or for your investment. So we cut it down to seven and a half. And nobody pulled out, nobody withdrew. But we used all our persuasive power and we said, this is the pride of Scandinavia, it's at stake. You know, we have been attacked by an American company, we must win. And, but we used, we took a two plus two million investment, the first million, so the first of the first tranche, half of it we spent on the lawsuit. So it was a very expensive exercise, but it turned out to be the best marketing campaign MySQL ever did. So it really served us well, but, but it was scary. So there, the, the valuation was that. Then when we closed our B round, I remember we were so proud that somebody on Sand Hill Road would be interested in a company operating out of Finland and Sweden. So we, we came here and talked to Benchmark, and they asked us, so guys, what kind of valuation are you thinking of? And I can nearly remember, or maybe I'm fantasizing that I remember, how I sat there saying, we have projected next 12 months sales to be 7 million and we want four times that which I said with big pride so 28 million Benchmark looked at us and said okay <laughs> <laughs> so I asked, okay was I too low <laughs> I don't think so I think it was Ill, although the company then was sold at a billion I think it was fair for everyone involved once MySQL got sold, the original shares in the company, so the, the, the common stock that the founders held in the beginning, had risen from that 7.5 million to 280 million in value. And the VCs shared 520 million, and then the employees and the management got 200 million to share. So it was, and this is the learning. If you have a successful exit, everybody is happy. If you have an unsuccessful exit, nobody is happy. Meaning that the valuation doesn't matter so much anyhow. Because if you really do well, you will be happy. You won't go back and think, why I, I should have had 10% higher valuation at that point. You don't do that. You're just so thankful that you, you got the price paid. So, so I'm, I'm not sure this helps you, but... Therefore, in terms of valuation, I would ask for what's reasonable. I would test with a few VCs, say, what would you think? And the good VCs will give you a reasonably honest answer. And then it's important to not get too high of a valuation, because what happens if your valuation is high? Then the stock options get a higher strike price. So your employees who are hiring have... They, you must grow more for them to get a benefit out of it. You want them to get cheap stock, not expensive stock. And also, if you bring in an uh, investment at a high valuation, the burden is on you to, to go get it up. So it puts pressure on the management, and sometimes too much pressure. And then if you have to do a down round, people see it as a failure. So it's really, if you can adjust it, you would go steady and always up but not too much up so an out you know outlandish valuation can actually work against you and that happened with a company i worked for a finnish company called solid information technology it was a database company i worked for they got an outlandish investment at some amazing valuation and so much money that it blinded the company they thought they were as good as the valuation and they had so much cash that they started spending it. And ultimately, the company got sold for a fifth of what it had been worth then. So most people got no money at all. I never got any money out of the company. So that's why, you know, don't focus too much on valuation. Focus on getting the best VCs and having a steady increase so that it's manageable and so that you don't get those weird behaviors. I know when I was young and we had a high valuation on a company, I started calculating on paper how much I was worth on paper. And then you go out and you eat an expensive dinner and you come home and say, hey, 
I don't have that money yet. And I never got it. We lost all the money. So it's, it's dangerous to, to start thinking too much about it. Okay, so, so let's, yeah, let me let me yeah. just ask one last question. So you tweeted that uh, you have a feeling that the symmetries um, drive the world rather than symmetries. So maybe a couple of minutes on that. Yes, that was sort of a philosophical thing. I was sitting in some meeting and and I wasn't sure. So that's why I wrote, "I have a feeling." But but there's so much in life where we strive for symmetries. We try to make it look symmetrical. We require that it is symmetrical. Everything needs to be symmetrical to be good and beautiful and great. But then I realized that sometimes when it's asymmetric, that's when things really happen. Like great companies are really small in the beginning. So they, are, they do asymmetric warfare. MySQL, we always said, you know, we have 500 employees. Oracle had 50,000 and we competed against them. And, and sort of... I started thinking that it is those, if you look for those asymmetrical situations, that's probably where, where something happens. But, but I tweeted it so that others would perfect the thinking and prove me wrong or something. Because every time, I've learned it with open source, every time I'm stupid and don't know something, I just ask the question. And soon somebody will come to me and say, Martin, I know the answer to the question. And I'm like, great, that was my purpose. So, so people who have opinions on symmetries and asymmetries, they should come to me and educate me. But, but that's, I think that's the, maybe, maybe beautiful things are symmetrical and really, really beautiful things are a little bit asymmetrical. Are you introducing asymmetry in uh, your work, in your company? I, no, not technically in the product. But I try to be, <laughs> as a CEO, I sometimes try to rock the boat a little bit and sort of avoid the symmetries and the regularities just to keep people awake. So, Martin, thank you so much. Thank you.